Too busy not to pray. Slowing down to be with God. By Bill Hybels, 1988. Chapter 2. God is willing. God is busy keeping the cosmos in order. He doesn't want to hear about my little problems. God would think I was selfish if I prayed for my own needs. If I really love him, I'll put myself in last place. I know that the cattle on a thousand hills belong to God, but that's just a figure of speech. He's not in the business of taking care of me, and I won't ask him to do it. Have you ever made any statements like these? If so, you're not alone, but you're tragically mistaken. Those statements are all based on a lie straight from hell, the lie that God doesn't care about his children. Jesus told his disciples a story to help them understand how God feels about our prayers. Unfortunately, many people misunderstand the story. In fact, some Christians think it says just the opposite of what Jesus intended. The story is recorded in Luke 18, verses 2 to 5. In a certain town, there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with the plea, Grant me justice against my adversary. For some time he refused, but finally he said to himself, Even though I don't fear God or care about men, Yet, because this widow keeps bothering me, I will see that she gets justice so that she won't eventually wear me out with her coming. The Desperate Widow The main character in the story is a widow. In the United States today, however, widowhood is not usually as desperate as it was in the Middle East 2,000 years ago. In our culture, widows can be wealthy. They can hold positions of influence. And even though many widows face severe financial problems, they are at least allowed to work, attend school, and own property. When Jesus told this story, the situation was quite different. A widow generally had no education, no job, no money, no property, no power, no status. If she had a son, father, or brother-in-law, who would care for her, she could survive. If not, she might become a beggar, the first century equivalent of a street person or bag lady. She would be a social outcast. In Jesus' story, the widow had an adversary. Some unnamed local villain was harassing her. Perhaps the person was intimidating her physically. Perhaps the person was withholding or stealing funds that should have been used for her support. In any case, the adversary was winning and she was losing. The widow had no good way to protect herself, no relatives to see her plight and offer help, no governmental organization to come to her aid. She had only one shot at warding off this villain. She could go before a local judge and plead her case, throwing herself on his mercy. And that is what she decided to do. The Unjust Judge Enter the second character, the judge. Jesus described him in two crisp statements. He did not fear God and he did not respect other human beings. Without fear of God, this judge had no sense of accountability. He did not respect God's word, his wisdom, or his justice. He did not worry that at some future day of reckoning, he would have to give an account for his decisions. Therefore, he made his own justice, decreeing whatever suited his fancy. Like a loaded cannon loosed on deck, he fired wherever he wished. Without respect for other human beings, this judge didn't care how his decisions affected the people who looked for justice in his courtroom. Since people didn't matter to him, he felt free to use and abuse them. He did not see them as brothers and sisters, but as problems, interruptions, headaches, hassles. And this judge was the widow's last resort. It makes you want 
to say to her, don't waste your time going to court. The judge is probably in cahoots with your enemy. He will laugh in your face and throw you out in the streets. That, of course, is exactly what he did, but the story doesn't end with his dismissal of the case. Justice through pestering. Hurt and shocked by the judge's behavior, the widow gathered her wits and examined her situation one more time. With grim resolve, she said to herself, I don't have any other options. This judge is my only hope. Somehow I must get him to protect me. But how could she do this? No higher court would hear her case. Penniless, she couldn't even bribe the judge. I know what I'll do, she said to herself. I will pester him. Every time that judge turns around, I'm going to be right in his face. I'll follow him home. I'll follow him to work. I'll follow him to the racetrack. I will be on him like a shirt until he offers me protection, puts me in jail, or kills me. So that's what she did, and it worked. She pestered the judge until one day he raised the window in his office and shouted, I can't take it anymore. Somebody fix this widow's problem. I don't care what it takes, just do it. She is driving me crazy. The happy ending to this story is that the crooked, uncaring judge finally gave the widow protection from her adversary. Yet, he did not do this from the goodness of his heart, but only because of her extraordinary ability to pester him. A completely wrong interpretation. Luke says Jesus told this story to show his disciples that they should always pray and not give up. Verse 1. A lot of readers, having come just this far in the story, make a grave error in interpreting it. Thinking of it as an allegory, they look at it like this. We humans are like the widow, impoverished, powerless, with no connections and no status. We are unable to handle our problems alone and feel that we have nowhere to turn. God, then, must be like the judge. These misguided readers continue. He's not really interested in our situation. After all, he has the universe to run, angels to keep in harmony, harps to tune. It's best not to bother him unless it's really important. If we're desperate, though, we can always do what the widow did. We can pester him. Bang on the doors of heaven. Spend hours on our knees. Ask our friends to pester him, too. Sooner or later, we may wear him down and wrench a blessing from his tightly closed fist. Eventually, he may shout, I can't take it anymore. Somebody fix this problem. Does that interpretation sound right to you? I hope not. But how often I talk with people who seem to think God is like that judge. They are absolutely convinced that the greatest challenge associated with prayer is finding the lost key that will somehow unlock the vault of blessings that God, for some reason, would prefer not to open. I get tired of reading titles that promise to divulge the secret of getting past God's reluctance to reveal the little known way to pester our way into his presence. Please, please don't ever think of God that way. Jesus never meant this story to imply that God is like that callous judge. Our responsive God. What then does the story mean? Jesus himself interpreted it as soon as he finished telling it. You've heard how the unjust judge reacted. He said, now look at God's approach. Will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him day and night? Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice and quickly. Verses 7 and 8. 
According to Jesus, this story is not an allegory, where elements in the story stand for truths outside the story. Instead, it is a parable, a short story with a puzzling aspect that forces listeners to think. This particular parable is a study in opposites. Take a look at the contrasts. First, we are not like the widow. In fact, we are totally opposite to her. She was poor, powerless, forgotten, and abandoned. She had no relationship with the judge. For him, she was just one more item on his to-do list. But we are not abandoned. We are God's adopted sons and daughters, Jesus' brothers and sisters. We are in God's family, and we matter to him. So don't tiptoe into God's presence trying to find the secret of attracting his attention. Just say, hello, Father, and know that he loves to hear your voice. Second, our loving Heavenly Father is nothing like the judge in Jesus' story. The judge was crooked, unrighteous, unfair, disrespectful, uncaring, and preoccupied with personal matters. By contrast, our God is righteous and just, holy and tender, responsive and sympathetic. The psalmist says, Taste and see that the Lord is good. Psalm 34, verse 8. Don't think you have to figure out a way to wrench a blessing from him, somehow to trick him into giving up what he would rather keep for himself. God's word teaches that God loves to bestow blessings on his children. It is his nature. It's who he is, a giving God, a blessing God an encouraging God, a nurturing God, an empowering God, a loving God. Abundant Blessings One of the most theologically enlightening experiences I've ever had occurred when I bought my son a BMX bicycle. He thought he was excited, and he was. But after watching him ride it up and down the driveway that first day, I had tears in my eyes when I walked back into the house. I said to my wife, Lynn, if that bike had cost $500, it would have been worth it. I've never gotten more joy from giving a gift to anyone. I got goosebumps watching him ride that bike, seeing his eyes wide open with excitement. Right then and there, I started making plans to buy him a Harley someday, and a car. Over the years, I've heard parents complain. I have kids that are applying to college and somehow I'll have to cough up the money. Maybe they're kidding when they act so put out. Personally, it has been a great joy to help my kids get a college education. The sacrifices Lynn and I have made do not compare with the growth and development we see in our kids' lives. I didn't read textbooks to get these feelings. They're just there. I'm crazy about giving things to my kids. And I'm coming to understand that it gives God great joy to bestow resources and power on his children. The Bible teaches us that we serve a God who is simply looking for opportunities to pour out his blessings on us. It's as if he were saying, what good are my resources if I don't have anyone to share them with? Just give me a reasonable amount of cooperation and I will pour out my blessings on you. This theme shows up in the Bible time and time again. Leviticus 26 verses 3 to 6 tells us, If you follow my decrees and are careful to obey my commands, I will send you rain in its season, and the ground will yield its crops, and the trees of the field their fruit. Your threshing will continue until grape harvest, and the grape harvest will continue until planting. And you will eat all the food you want, and live in safety in your land. 
I will grant peace in the land, and you will lie down, and no one will make you afraid. I will remove savage beasts from the land, and the sword will not pass through your country. Deuteronomy 28, verses 2 to 6, and verse 12 says, All these blessings will come upon you and accompany you if you obey the Lord your God. You will be blessed in the city and blessed in the country. The fruit of your womb will be blessed, and the crops of your land and the young of your livestock, the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. Your basket and your kneading trough will be blessed. You will be blessed when you come in and blessed when you go out. The Lord will grant that the enemies who rise up against you will be defeated before you. The Lord will open the heavens, the storehouse of his bounty, to send rain on your land in season and to bless all the work of your hands. You will lend to many nations, but will borrow from none. The words of Nathan the prophet to King David right after he confessed his adultery with Bathsheba, are especially poignant. This is what the Lord, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if all this had been too little, I would have given you even more. Why did you despise the word of the Lord by doing what is evil in his eyes? 2 Samuel 12, verses 7 to 9. In other words, David, I had all kinds of favors and blessings and resources and power that I was going to pour into your life. Why did you mess things up? A Rich Inheritance All through the Old Testament, we see the theme that God is ready and willing to share his resources with his people. In the New Testament, this concept is extended and made even more precious. There we learn that we have been adopted as God's sons and daughters and have become heirs along with Jesus Christ of his glorious kingdom. Jesus taught us to call God Father, actually Papa. The most repeated prayer in the Christian church begins, Our Father. In love, God predestined us to be adopted as his sons through Jesus Christ. Ephesians 1 verse 5. You are no longer a slave, but a child. And if a child, then also an heir through God. Galatians 4 verse 7. New Revised Standard Version. In Romans 8, verses 16 and 17, Paul wrote, The Spirit himself testifies with our spirit that we are God's children. Now, if we are children, then we are heirs, heirs of God, and co-heirs with Christ. If indeed we share in his sufferings, in order that we may also share in his glory. What a fantastic promise! God will cover us with blessings because he has adopted us as his sons and daughters. As God's children and legal heirs, we own the world and the universe. Should we ever fear to tell our father our needs? Generous Fathers I had access to anything my father owned, just as soon as I was capable of handling it properly. One of his prized possessions was a 45-foot sailboat. When I was in eighth grade, my dad would say to me, why don't you get one of your buddies? Hitchhike out to South Haven and take the boat out. Once my brother and I had our driver's licenses, he was equally generous with the car. If he got a new car, the first thing he would do when he came home was to give us each a set of keys and say, take it for a spin. If you want to take it out on a date, go ahead. 
Most fathers love to be generous with their children. Jesus understood this, and that is why he used fathers to explain God's generosity. Which of you, if his son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? Matthew 7, verses 9 to 11. Do you see the picture Jesus is painting? The sun has been out in the fields working all day. By the time he comes home, he's famished. The family is at the table, and dishes of steaming, fragrant food are being passed around. Can you imagine a father who would toss the boy a rock and say, Here, gnaw on this? Or worse, one who would toss him an angry snake? No earthly fathers are perfect. We are all tainted with sin. Even so, we all recognize this as cruel. Good fathers want to give good gifts to their children, and so does our Heavenly Father. Our Father's Delight For some reason, though, most of us have a hard time accepting the gifts God gives us. In the past, when God would bless me with a special portion of His Spirit, a material item I had been wanting, or a warm new relationship, I can distinctly remember feeling God must have had his wires crossed. Why would he do that for me? In fact, I would feel guilty about my good fortune as if I had somehow acquired something that God didn't really want me to have. I'm learning to give God a little credit. If imperfect fathers love to bestow blessings on their children, Imagine how our perfect Father in Heaven must delight in giving good gifts to us, His beloved children. Look again at the statements at the beginning of this chapter, statements we have all made at one time or another. Think of how brutal they would sound if they represented the attitudes of a human father. I'm busy at the office. I don't want to hear about your lost bike or unfair teacher. Don't bother me with your personal needs. I want to take care of everyone but you. If you really love me, you'll survive on bread and water. Sure, I'm rich, but there's no reason I should give you anything. Back off. Good fathers don't talk like that. Good fathers are like my dad. He was a busy man who traveled all over the world. When he was in the office, it was hard to get past the switchboard and several secretaries. That's why he gave a few select business partners, his wife and us kids, his private number. We knew that no matter how busy he was, we could call him any time and be sure of reaching him. I also have a private line that rings right on my desk. I've given the number to a few colleagues to use in emergencies and have given it to my wife and children. I've told my kids they can call me anytime for any reason. Believe me, no one's voice sounds sweeter to me than theirs. When I hear, hi, Dad, I don't care what I'm juggling, it can drop. My children are an absolute priority to me. Now take a father's feeling for his children and multiply it exponentially and you'll know how your Heavenly Father feels about you. No one's voice sounds sweeter to God than yours. Nothing in the cosmos would keep Him from directing His full attention to your requests. Is anything holding you back from making them known to Him right now? <laughs>